Good morning, everybody. Can I invite you to kind of make your way towards grabbing a seat again? If we've not had a chance to meet before, my name is Dave. I'm one of the leaders here at Life Church. It's great to have you um, with us this morning. In a few minutes' time, I'll, um, I'll be starting us in a new preaching series. We're taking a, a three-week divergence from our series that we've been going through in the Old Testament book of Psalms over the summer. We will be coming back to looking at the book of Psalms in three weeks' time. But whilst we're on that break, um, when, we, when we started looking at the book of Psalms, one of the things we kind of challenged one another to do was to be people who don't just know that the psalms are there but who actually take the psalms into us and so one of the things that we're kind of encouraging one another to do over the course of the summer as we're looking at the book of psalms is to memorize psalm 100 um, total confession time i have not done a minute of doing that yet um, so here's, uh, this is me making myself accountable to you all and inviting you to join me in that is that in, over the course of the next three weeks, whilst we're on that break in the series of Psalms, I'm going to try and memorise Psalm 100. And can I invite you to join me to try and memorise the words of Psalm 100? It's not long. I've got it open in front of me, five short verses. Um, one of the reasons I was inspired to do this was because a, um, a few years ago I, I memorised the psalm actually that Miriam was um, praying over Eden earlier this morning, um, the the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And um, if you, what you find, if, if you memorise a psalm, it's not just a, a kind of a nice thing to have done for when you're kind of in a quiet time, but it means you can take, you can take the psalms to some really strange places. So, like sometimes, if like sometimes, I will now uh, read kind of Psalm 23 to myself at the gym if it hurts. So I'll kind of be sweating away, thinking you've, got, you've, just got, you've got about a minute left on whatever exercise you're doing. And I know it takes about a minute for me to go, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. This does not feel like a green pasture. He leads me beside still waters. Why am I still sweating? And he restores my soul. This does not feel like it's restoring my soul. So can I invite you, join me three weeks to try and learn by memory Psalm 100 so that you can take Psalm 100 into strange places with you. Because over the next three weeks, um, instead of looking at the book of Psalms, we're going to be doing a kind of three-week mini-series called The Bread and Wine, where we're spending three weeks think thinking about the table that is actually laid out at the front corner of this room, about communion, and thinking about what it is. And the title that I'm talking about as we think about that this morning is the title of Who's Invited for Lunch? And before I pray, let me say, I think, I think this might be the most ineffective sermon I have ever preached. This might be the most pointless kind of 25 minutes I've ever stood up to talk about. And I'll explain why in a minute, but let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a good God who gives gifts, that you have given so many gifts to us. Thank you for the gift of, of the church. Thank you for the gift of your gospel, the good news about Jesus. Thank you for the gift of children, for the gift of this table that we have in front of us, for the gift of your grace to us, for the gift of your word. Lord, you are such a good God to us. And Lord, I pray that this morning would be a morning where we receive your gifts with glad and open hearts that we take joy in what you give to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, imposter syndrome is something that's kind of really hard to get rid of. I remember um, when I was 15, I had started playing hockey for a kind of adults hockey team and um, at the start of the season when I was 15 um, I, I and a couple of other of my mates made it into the first team squad and I remember sitting in the kind of dressing room with a bunch of adults who were much better hockey players than I were, was feeling that sense of imposter syndrome feeling that sense of I don't really belong here and I don't think I was the only person feeling it because because a couple of my mates had made it into the team as well, who were the same age as I was, and it was clearly present enough in the atmosphere that the coach felt the need to say something about it, and I've always been able to remember what he said. He said that, look around the room. He said, if you look around the room, and do you think there are 
are good hockey players in this room. And if you, if you think there are good hockey players in this room, they are your teammates. And that means that you belong on a team with them, which means you are a good hockey player as well. And that means that you belong here and that this team belongs in this league. I have absolutely no recollection of whether the kind of stirring speech did anything to the result of that game. The fact that I don't remember it probably makes me think it didn't go that well. But I remember it nonetheless that imposter syndrome has a kind of way of, of haunting us, the feeling like we don't belong. And often, in order to get rid of imposter syndrome, something needs to be said, but being said isn't enough. It needs to be acted on. And as a church, we're actually pretty fearful that anybody would experience imposter syndrome when they come here. We want anyone and everybody who comes to church to feel like they belong. We don't want you to feel like you're not welcome here. We don't, want, we don't want you to feel come in here and feel like everybody else seems to know what they're doing and there's a kind of bunch of unwritten rules and everyone else is following them and, and I'm kind of stumbling around not knowing what's the right thing to do. And so we are consciously informal as a church. We try to make things relax so that people don't feel like imposters here because we want church to be a family, a family where other people are invited in. And so whether you consider yourself a member of that family, whether you call yourself a Christian, and so you feel completely like you belong, whether you would call yourself a Christian but you feel a little bit like it's not your family when you're here, we still want to counter that feeling and we want you to feel like you belong. And if you, if you don't consider yourself a, a member of the family, you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, but you just want to be a, a guest at dinner... We want this to be as informal and as relaxed and as welcoming as possible for you. We want you to know that you're welcome. That church is supposed to be like coming around for dinner. Something that you, you would do if you knew you were invited and every moment in that process you would feel and it would be reaffirmed to you that you are invited to come here, to be welcome here. We don't want it to be like a, a really formal kind of dinner party or event where you're kind of constantly on edge that you might do something that undermines the invitation you've been given. You might you know, use the wrong fork at the wrong time or, or pick up the wrong glass and break some kind of unwritten code of etiquette that undermines the fact that you're invited to be here. And because that we have consciously and deliberately try to make church informal, that probably means that we haven't talked a great deal about communion, about the bread and wine, about the table that is in front of us, because we don't want to overly formalise it, and we don't want to overly formalise church. We want this to be like a family meal, not like a black tie dinner party. And it's we don't want to become a, a kind of a religious event that is so religious that it forgets why it does what it does. We don't want it to be a kind of the, what happens at church to be such a set of set things and rules that can easily kind of get lost from the purpose of doing it all in the first place. But equally so, for fear of formalism, we don't want to become like a family who for fear of formalism never eat together. We don't want to be estranged from one another and never doing things together and never enjoying the gifts that God has given us. And so what we're doing today and over the course of these three weeks is trying to get back to the heart of what the gift that this table is in front of us is and what it is for and how we can make the best use of it. Because... That is a huge trend within the way that God treats us. God gives us gifts, and if we receive those gifts, we make the most out of them and are changed by them. That's, that's what happens in the gospel. The gospel of Jesus' grace to us is not just a kind of thing that's out there that is best used if it just kind of stays out there in some kind of theoretical way. No, the gospel is good news to us. And when we receive it, if we receive it, it totally transforms us. And that is the way that this gift 
of the table in front of us is supposed to be used as well. Because that's how Jesus talks about it. He talks about it like a gift. Um, Let me read you these verses from Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 to 29. You can follow along if you've got a Bible of your own, but they will all be up on the screen behind me. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread. And after blessing it, and blessing it, broke it. And gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Do you notice there how Jesus talks about the bread and the wine like a gift? In fact, he just says it's a gift because he gives it to them. After blessing the bread, he broke it and gave it to them. After he had given thanks, he gave them the wine. And what kind of gift is it? He says this strange phrase, this is... Like the wine, particularly, he says, is my blood of the covenant. And now, what does that mean? Because that's strange. Well, the covenant in the Old Testament that God had was a, a covenant with between God and His people. A covenant that said that those people would be God's people, and that if if they obeyed God, they would find blessing in that obedience. And if they, if they disobeyed God, if they rebelled against him, they would find brokenness in that rebellion. And the problem, of course, was that over years and years and repeatedly and repeatedly, the people discovered over and over again the brokenness of rebellion almost more often than they discovered the blessing of obedience. And so because that is what kept happening to that covenant that God had made with his people, prophets came and said that there will be a new covenant coming. This is how Jeremiah puts it in Jeremiah chapter 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their inequity and I will remember their sins no more. When Jesus offers the bread and wine to his friends, he is offering them the new covenant. He is saying what Jeremiah was talking about, it is here now and I am offering it to you that the law will no longer need to be written on tablets of stone out there, that the law can be written on your hearts, it can be within you. That you do not need to relate to me through other people who say that they know me, but no, every one of you can know me personally. And that every one of you, every one of you who has failed to live in the blessing of obedience and has discovered the brokenness of disobedience, every one of that brokenness that's come through disobedience, every one of those inequities, every one of those sins, that can be forgiven. That can be washed away by Jesus. That is the covenant that Jesus is offering when he breaks bread and offers wine to his friends. And it's what he offers to you and I. But he does say, uncomfortably, that it is in his blood. Now, why does he say that? Well, the clue to why he says that is in what we just read in Jeremiah 29 as well. Because in Jeremiah 29, it said, 
not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. When the people of Israel were living in slavery in Egypt and God was rescuing from that, what they had to do in order to receive the rescue that God was giving them was to sacrifice a lamb. And then Exodus chapter 12 verse 7 says, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel, which is the bit above a doorpost, and then they will eat the lamb. That the, the covenant that God gave his first people came through the blood of a lamb that was sacrificed. And the new covenant was going to come as well through the blood of a lamb that was sacrificed. Um, a few years ago, I, I went to a church where the, um, the pastor had previously been a butcher. And whenever he talked about these uh, verses in Exodus chapter 12, um, he would simply say, blood, blood runs. And the point he would make that, look, if you are putting the blood on the doorpost on either side of a door and on the lintel above a door, you will make a cross because blood runs. That the new covenant that's coming in Jesus' blood is the covenant in the blood of a cross. That Jesus is going to die that brutal, agonizing death and he is going to do it so that he can bring about this new thing. That the law does not need to be written on tablets of stone, but the law can be written in our hearts. That, that, that our sins and our inequities, everything we do wrong, all the stuff we mess up, all of the brokenness that we experience because of our own rebellion, it will not be held against us because Jesus will forgive our sins. That each and every one of us can know God. That it's not just some expert people can know God, but that everybody can know the living God. And this good news comes to each of us as a gift, and it comes with this meal to accompany the gift. Haven't you noticed how that's actually something we tend to do? When, th when gifts and like celebratory things happen, we eat about it. Whether it's the, that, like, the, the big takeaway you order because you found out you got promotion at work, or the Christmas dinner that you enjoy because it's a celebratory day, or the, the barbecue you host because your child's getting dedicated, or the list goes on. When we celebrate, we eat. When we have good news, we eat. And that's what this is. This is eating and drinking because we have received good news. God has given us this strange little meal as a thing to do that helps us to understand the good news and the promise of the gospel, the forgiveness of sins, eternal life, the grace has come to us because of Jesus' sacrifice for us. Which does point us to the question, well, what, what does this strange little meal actually do? What does this portion of bread and this portion of wine actually do. Well, there's two passages in the New Testament that kind of explain that a bit for us. One is in 1 Corinthians verses, uh, chapters 10 and 11. Uh, the other is John chapter 6. I won't read both of them in full now, but one, some of the things that they point out this meal does. 1 Corinthians shows us that what this meal is, is, is what it calls a participation. It is something that, that we are united with Jesus in. That this meal is in some way, the same way that all meals are kind of horizontal, in all meals you kind of feel the presence of the people you're eating with. You, whether it's your colleagues who you have, work, uh, have lunch with at work, or whether it's the, the kind of people who you live with, who you eat dinner with in the evening, or whether it's you're just aware of the fact that you eat meals on your own, you have breakfast in such a hurry, or that kind of weeknights when you'll find yourself eating on your own and you're conscious of your loneliness. All meals have a kind of horizontal element to them where you're aware of who you are or aren't eating with. But this meal also has a vertical element to it. It is a participation, it is a fellowship with Jesus himself, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says. And as well as being that vertical thing, it is also that horizontal thing, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 17 says, it is a sign as of our unity as brothers and sisters in Christ, that we all come around 
these tables. All of us. And as we do it, as we take this bread and drink this wine, it somehow articulates, it proclaims what Jesus has done for us, 1 Corinthians 11 says. The, the reminder, the visual kind of picture of the broken body of Jesus and the spilt blood of Jesus, it says the gospel out loud. It's like the first century kind of equivalent of like a logo or a kind of branding campaign that makes things visible to everybody. But then as well as those things, in John chapter 6, it says that we participate in the benefits of Jesus' death through this, that we gain a kind of spiritual nourishment. In the same way that when we eat a meal, it is not just about the people who we're sitting across from, it's also about what we're actually eating, isn't it? It's why we, we eat meals all the time, because it gives us something. It is good for us that we need it to survive. This is a meal that does stuff. This is a meal that affects us. And that's exactly the same way that the gospel is supposed to. The gospel is not supposed to be something that, like I said earlier, is just out there and is a kind of convenient kind of philosophical or theological truth. The gospel is supposed to affect us. It is supposed to change us. The news that that all of my all of my dirtiest, darkest rebellion against God, every time I have messed things up, all of the ways in which my heart has wandered away from the God who it was made to worship and acknowledge, all of those things Jesus has dealt with by dying for me on the cross, that he has welcomed me home like a rebellious child who has come back to him with his tail between his legs. He has been more than happy to receive me and he is more than happy to receive you and so when he comes and welcomes us home, he throws a feast for us. A feast that changes us in the same way that that good news changes us. This thing is supposed to affect us. It's supposed to be good for us. And when we get into the, when we get into the details of how it does that, um, I think that the world we live in would kind of want us to do one of two things. When we get into the details of how anything ever affects us, we tend to be obsessed, uh, kind of culturally, with either mechanics or mysticism. The, our, our obsession with mechanics is that we want to know how everything works, and so science sells. So it doesn't matter if you're watching an advert for shampoo, or you're watching a TED talk on uh, how to be more productive at work. At some point, it will come with a big dose of science to explain the mechanics of how it is because science sells. And then eventually, some of us get so tired of the science and the mechanics of everything that we want to just kind of leap into an entirely different world of mysticism, of not thinking at all about the science. And so, Modern trends like uh, like crystals or like manifestation are deliberately unscientific most of the time as a kind of kickback against the mechanics of everything and it wants to be more mystical. Well, what might surprise you is that I think people are used to Christians saying, ooh, that's bad mysticism, um, and kind of not really saying anything about this. But in actual fact, Christianity doesn't really pander to either of those views. It won't be a kind of obsessively mechanical or obsessively mystic. The bread and the wine do stuff that is, that is entirely explainable. You can explain how this proclaims Jesus' death until he comes because it is a visual picture of his broken body and his spilt blood. And you can explain how this is something that is uniting for us because as people from all sorts of different walks of life, if you would call yourself a Christian, you are welcome to this table and that unites us. But it also does things that aren't entirely mechanically explainable. And it's supposed to. It is a union, a participation with Jesus, a fellowship with him. It is supposed to be a reminder of the transcendent, of the enchanted, of the spiritual. And in a world that generally tries to help us forget the transcendent or the, transcendent or the enchanted or the spiritual, 
it is a good thing to be reminded of. And so it is a good thing to give our time to. Um, We've been doing um, Alpha at the Boathouse over the last uh, kind of five weeks or so, inviting people to come think about the bigger questions of life and explore whether Jesus is the answer to some of those bigger questions. At one point, that it, it shows a statistic that I was fascinated by, that if you, live to, um, if you live to be 70 years old, you will, on average, spend about 20 years and three months of your life asleep. You will spend, on average, about 10 years and five months of your life watching TV. About five years and nine months on some kind of transportation. About seven years and six months eating and drinking. And so the invitation to Alpha is in some ways an invitation to go, why not spend 24 hours over the course of a few weeks thinking about the answer to life's big questions? I think that's a, that's a really good idea. If you've never done Alpha or you've never seriously explored Christianity, I would love to invite you. Why not spend 24 hours of your life thinking about some of the biggest questions that there could possibly be? Thinking about meaning and purpose and eternity and forgiveness and whether Christianity has anything to say in response to those. Because somebody who is a Christian is somebody who has found that those questions about meaning and purpose and eternity and forgiveness have been answered in Jesus. And so if you're a Christian and you have found that Jesus is the answer to those questions of meaning and purpose and forgiveness and eternity, you will still spend 20 years and three months of your life asleep. You will still spend 10 years and five months watching TV. You'll still spend five years and nine months on some kind of transportation. You'll still spend seven years and six months eating and drinking. So why not give some of that eating and drinking time to eating and drinking the meal that Jesus has given us to eat and drink? Why not consider it worth our time to share this meal together? Because it will do stuff, but because it is also stuff that is worth doing. Now, there may be lots of questions that people have about, about the bread and wine, about communion. And can I say that's a good thing to have? We want you to have questions and to find answers to those questions. In two weeks' time, when I'm, uh, I'm back speaking again on this subject, I'm going to be spending a lot of time answering those questions. So if you do have questions about, about this and about how we do this and the practice of this, please can you ask them to me? Because I, I might not be able to answer them if you don't tell me what they are. And so when you're finding out in two weeks' time if I've been any, in any way successful in trying to memorise Psalm 100, um, please, before then, ask me questions about this meal, because I want to be able to answer them. Those, there might be questions that people have about, uh, about spiritual gifts and the bread and wine, and how we can practice spiritual gifts like prayer and prophecy and healing whilst we're taking this meal together. It might be you've got questions about, um, about children and about at what age or which, what children should be allowed to, um, to take this bread and wine. And those are good questions. If you're here and um, if you're here because you're part of youth this morning and youth work's not on and you're wondering, hold on, am I, am I allowed to do this? Um, ask the grown-up who you come to church with um, and have a conversation with them about it even now. Um, because people have been asking questions about this table for a long time. And sometimes asking those questions and answering them is a really helpful way of understanding what it's for. In, um, in 1562, a guy called Elector Friedrich III, who was at the time in charge of an area that's kind of roughly similar to Germany, um, ordered the creation of something called the Heidelberg Catechism. Um, Heidelberg is a place name. Uh, catechism is just a word that means teaching. So kind of a, a teaching that comes out of this place called Heidelberg. They wanted to do it for a, a few reasons. The first was that they knew that the future of the church lay in young, in the young, in youth and in children, in, in people like Eden and Florence, who we've prayed for this morning. And so if the future of the church was held in those people, they needed to make sure that they had a way of sharing what was true with the young. 
It was also a guide to how people could preach over the course of a year. And it was also a way of uniting Christians about what they believe. It's fundamentally a bunch of like statements of theology in answer to questions so that Christians wouldn't be endlessly dividing over stuff that they could be united around what they believe. And so um, Friedrich III gathered a bunch of kind of theologians and church leaders together and um, they put together this thing called the Heidelberg Catechism. The kind of chief engineer of it was a guy called Zacharias Ursinus, which now to me um, sounds like the name of a Star Wars character, but that's maybe just a reflection of the fact I've been watching Kenobi over the last few weeks rather than actually what his name's about. But a couple of the questions that the Heidelberg Catechism asks and answers help us to understand this table really well. So question number 75 is this. How does the Lord's Supper remind you and assure you that you share in Christ's one sacrifice on the cross and in all his gifts. In this way, as surely as I see with my eyes the bread of the Lord broken for me and the cup given to me, so surely his body was offered and broken for me. As surely as I receive the bread and the cup of the Lord, so surely he nourishes and refreshes my soul. This is Jesus' response to anybody feeling imposter syndrome at church. Even if you feel like you don't belong, you are welcome to this table. And as surely as you see what's in front of you, so surely has he died for you. Then the next question is what does it mean to eat the crucified body of Christ and to drink his poured out blood? It means to accept with a believing heart the entire suffering and death of Christ and by believing to receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life. But it means more. That through the Holy Spirit who lives in both Christ and in us, we are united more and more to Christ. This is a meal that unites us with Jesus, that welcomes the Holy Spirit to be with us. Uh, Andrew Wilson, the uh, theologian and author, he puts the togetherness of this like this. The triune God, that means God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune God is experienced in the church through the physical symbols of bread, wine, and water. That's baptism. Baptism. Through the word read, proclaimed, and the presence of the Holy Spirit amongst us. The three are interconnected, like Christmas, Easter, and Pentecost, each illuminating and making sense of the other. If one is marginalized, marginalized, the other two ultimately suffer. The desire to grow in the gift of the bread and the wine is not a desire to neglect the Holy Spirit and his presence amongst us or the gift of God's word and its reality to us. We shouldn't think that for a second. This doesn't need, in fact, it should not be some dry religious ceremony that's empty of the spirit of God. It should be as full of the Spirit as God, of God is as our most awesome time of worship together. I don't think it's an accident that um, just at, there are very few times in the Bible where Jesus is recorded as singing. I don't think it's an accident that one of them is in the verses that we read earlier as soon as he had given his friends this meal. Matthew 26, verse 30, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Immediately after, he broke the bread and poured the wine out with them. But if we do desire, one last kind of question that you might have. One, if we do desire to do this better, to make more of this gift, you might find yourself going, if we're going to do this better, can we do this really better? Like, could we have a nice sourdough and a good claret? And it might be that you find yourself going, what is a sad sourdough and who is claret? Um, th- those are understandable desires to do this better. 
But 1 Corinthians verse 10 makes it clear that what this meal is means that it is more important for it to be inclusive than for it to be a speciality. It is more important that this is a meal for everybody than it is fancy. And so if you find yourself going, it's a little plastic cup, could it not have a nice glass? If you're finding this little bit of bread that was cut and a long enough ago today that it's now become slightly dry, could we not have kind of a nice, a nice loaf each? That's a perfectly good desire to have, but we give up those desires this morning so that we can all do this. But also, if you long to do that, please do. Um, in kind of one of those like strange periods over the last couple of years where we were only allowed to um, be in groups of six inside, what uh, we started doing at home was inviting a couple of people around so that we had six people at home on a Sunday to watch church on TV. And as kind of unsatisfying as watching church on TV was, it was that much better by having other people from church there with us. And one of the things that we started doing was taking communion while we were there, because we could. And do you know what we did? We had a nice sourdough. And I got through lockdown by getting a Lathwaite subscription, so we had a nice, nice glass of wine as well. If you want to do this well, can I encourage you, do it well. Do it often. If you're in life groups in the next couple of weeks, take communion together. If you have people from church coming around to your house, why not, before you, before you you're watching TV together before you eat a meal together. Why not pour a little wine, break bread, and thank the Lord Jesus for what he has done? Because this is a family meal, you can do it when you meet with your family. But part of us being united, and at this being a meal that unites us, means that we do it in a way that brings everybody in and so therefore we maybe sometimes give up the things that we would like to have. So on a Sunday we don't necessarily have a sourdough. And it means that that we might find ourselves going, well I prefer it when I prefer it when we have communion when all of the kids are in with us. Or I prefer it when we have communion when the kids aren't in with us and I've got a bit more kind of headspace to focus on it. Or I prefer it when we take communion like this or I could prefer it when we, when we take communion like that. And sometimes we will do those things and sometimes we will do the other things. And part of what the joy of this is supposed to be is supposed to be the unity of doing this together. And that means that we're happy to give things up. So... Um, a, a few years ago, I became really good friends with somebody who is gluten-free. And uh, what I discovered was that that meant um, that I was very much gluten-full, that my regular diet was pretty gluten-heavy. But what I also realized was that even though eating gluten was the normal for me, giving it up was more than worth it for the presence of a good friend at dinner. This is a meal that we are supposed to take together. And if we aren't taking it in exactly the way that we would choose to do ourselves, I'm more than happy to do so if it means that I get to eat it with you. That is why this is the most ineffective sermon I've probably ever preached. Because for all that I have said this morning, it will be nowhere near as impactful and effective as us taking this meal together and uniting with one another and with Jesus in doing so. So in a moment, we're going to do that. I started this morning by asking the question, who is invited for lunch? Who is this meal for? And the short answer to that question is, you are. You are invited. And invited is the key. If, if, you are a, a non, if you are not a Christian and you're here this morning, you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, this meal in some way is a kind of flag post to say that you are invited. You are invited to believe in Jesus, to believe in his death on your behalf and the forgiveness that he offers you. And so please do not feel like you're being pushed into joining in with this as a, a kind of 
a process of religiousness that we think everybody should practice. No, we want you to hear that you're invited to believe. And so if you wouldn't call yourself a Christian and you're here this morning, no, we, we love to have you with us. You are invited to believe in Jesus. And we would, do not want to force you to kind of be more religious. And so please feel no obligation. If you are here this morning and you are a Christian and you do believe in Jesus, then you are invited to this table. You are invited to receive this gift that Jesus has given us. And any Christian is invited to do so. At the end of that meal, it's recorded in John chapter 15, when Jesus has been desperately trying to get over to his friends what he is going to do in the coming days. He says to them, look, tonight... I no longer call you my servants. I call you my friends. And I lay down my life for my friends. Jesus invites us to this meal because he has called us his friends. He has invited us to this meal. And if you are a believer, he invites you to believe and to share in this meal together. So that's what we're going to do in a moment. Can I ask the band to come back up? And I'm going to lead us in communion together and we can enjoy the bread and wine.